This is a talk by Jean Campbell uh, on the Four Temperaments on March 21st, uh, 2000, uh, held at the Trillium Waldorf School in uh, Guelph, Ontario, Canada. A wonderful space to give a talk in, that's for sure. It's lovely here. Uh, I'll just tell you a little joke about, about with my brother. He has a phone that sometimes it doesn't work, that he, he uh, can hear me, but he can't speak back. So he said to me one time on the phone, you can hear me, but I can't hear you. Just wait till I get on the other phone. And as soon as he picked up the other phone, I said to him, and that's the secret of success. <laughs> <laughs> and really, for me, the topic of the temperament is the secret of success. It's the most wonderful, fascinating topic. And since I first heard about it in 1982, it's only gotten more fascinating. And the wonderful thing about it is, that it applies not only to the work that I was doing with children, and I got to see the panorama of the variations on these themes, but it also applies to adult relationships. Temperament is something that starts from the early ages and goes all the way through your life. Of course, there will be changes, there will be maturing, but there is a basic flavoring that each person has to their, te to their temperament, and that's what we're going to look at. You might think of it as some um, different chili recipes. How do you know it's a chili? Well, there could be all kinds of different variations, but you still know it's a chili. There could be different spices. So even if I speak about one of the temperaments, I'm very much aware that there could be quite a vast number of variations within that temperament. The word temperament comes way back in time with the early Greeks. Mm -hmm. They were the first to write it, write it down, but may even have been known before that. The word itself comes from temporaire, which means to mix in due proportion. So it's a mixture. And even back then, the fundamental principle of temperament is very different than the way we try to organize information about people today. It wasn't a psychological mode as we do now. Um, what we see now are people try to understand people on the basis of perhaps um, race or culture or even um, gender. And you see lots of books that come out now that will describe what you're like because you're female or what you're like because you're male. But these are based on physical parameters. This particular approach I find 100% better because it's not working from the physicality, which is the part of course that is going to pass away. It assumes that we are, as K.R. Desjardins says, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So it's starting from the other pool altogether. And the basic principle is that all four temperaments reside in every person. So we don't have these uh, fundamental divisions where you, you get defined, perhaps because you're female. You don't have this huge category that suddenly you are destined to only be seen in that way. This assumes that every one of us has all four to varying degrees, but there will still be one of them that will predominate. So there will be one predominant of the day. Some people may say, well, I don't see very much of this one in me at all, and that's very possible. However, one of the other underlying principles is that by looking outside of yourself and seeing other people and how they meet experiences and seeing how they carry these temperaments, it can help you to find that in yourself. It is the way we learn everything. The first thing we do, even as a young child, they look out and they see something and then they can internalize it. So by seeing someone else perhaps carrying a melancholic temperament, we can begin to, if it's not our own, we can begin to learn and understand it and then find how does it fit in us. 
This bridging of the outer with the inner is an even more important task for parents and teaching. Because what would happen if I used my temperament to go into a classroom and work with 20 children? What would happen if I only used my temperament? I would go in there and all the little children that were just like me would be different. And they would have a wonderful education because we would be working out of the same worldview. But the ones that were the opposite of me would maybe even on the subtlest level, always feel like they're just a little bit out of the loop. Maybe the rhythm, the pace, the images. And the teacher is continuously setting the pace and setting the images and creating the environment for the child. The younger the, ch the child, the more the environment is imprinted on the child. So, when Steiner was founding Waldorf Education, I think it was a stroke of genius to say to the parents or to the teachers right from the beginning that one of the most important tasks ahead of you is to know and understand the temperaments and how they work. And uh, a beginning teacher, myself included, has a tendency to go into a classroom and start right away focusing on content. And most of us define education as a focus on content. But that's not what this is really about. What this is about is teaching real human beings. And the content, which yes, you teach content, it serves the development of the child. So Steiner indicates that one of the first things you should do as a teacher is to begin to do an observation of your children. And the observation will be done in a phenomenological way where you are observing <coughs> a behavior without um, working with your sympathy and antipathy, which might be if you like it or you don't like it. It's an observation. And you need to observe your children over a certain period of time because many things can affect the temperament in the short term. It could be the weather, it could be the home environment, it could be a certain life event. So you have to give it time to really see the child and know the child and to see them in different situations. But what you're trying to understand is what is this function of their consciousness that helps them to perceive the world in a certain way. Now why would I want to know that? Because another important principle in all of this is that we're not trying to find out what of these four the child is missing. What we're trying to say is that the child has a temperament, but they have the temperament and this particular temperament for a reason. And it's not an error. Although, <coughs> you can imagine that every pure temperament is a bit of an imbalance in itself because it's really the wholeness that <coughs> contains the greater truth of an experience. One of the <coughs> wonderful opportunities in the Waldorf classroom is that you have the chance, maybe almost 20 children, to have a sampling of each of the four temperaments. And what the teacher will do then <coughs> is during the lessons, even mathematics, the math, it could be storytelling, it could be any of the arts, but what the teacher can do in their planning is that they can keep at their back of their mind that they're working for wholeness, which is to give the children an experience <coughs> of all four perspectives on this particular topic. So let's say, for example, there's a story. Well, the teacher in planning the story would say to herself, okay, what in this story would really resonate for the alcoholic? What would resonate for the phlegmatic? And how do I then, in the storytelling, speak to each of these four temperaments? And that's the wonderful opportunity of creating a community where wholeness can be felt. That's the advantage. For parents at home, what you'll have to look at is what is the little um, possibility, what are the possibilities of 
the harmonious cosmos, they call it, which is the wholeness, in your family. And then you can start to look at what are the temperaments that are in the child's home environment. Now, every group, including this one, will have a predominant temperament. And as a teacher over 30 years, I could tell you very quickly which temperament I was going to be working with all year the most, which one was going to really start setting the pace. And a lot of them, of course, is affected by my own. It's true. But each group has its own temperament. Each family has its own temperament. In fact, each country has its own temperament. <coughs> Let's build up a picture of each of these temperaments so you can begin to uh, know on a deeper level what I've just been saying now. One experience that is common to all of us that is a wonderful one to, to remind ourselves of frequently is that experience of just coming to present. Just coming to a present moment where you can begin to feel that you are pressed up against this present moment of inner and outer. It's just a wonderful balance. And if you can stay hovering, just at that point between inner and outer, you can feel all of who you are and your whole life experience and everything that's come is there, but you're not really grabbing it and you're not really um, uh, pushing it forward. And on the other hand, things are out there and you are taking them in, but you're not really grabbing anything or holding it. You're just letting those two worlds meet. This is our primal experience of how we as human beings have to learn about the world. We start there. And what we do is we use our senses and we go out and we find something and we wrap our consciousness around it and we draw it forward <coughs> into the background of everything else. So there's this big, maybe 180 degree panorama. But at each given moment, something's going out and perhaps I'm putting a boundary around you and drawing you forward and then I will get to know you and then I'll put you back into the context. This is the way we do it. There's a certain falseness in that, taking them out of the context, but it's how we learn. And we have to uh, build into our approach looking at the foreground and looking at the background. Now there's two important factors about that. One is, who's selecting? And why? And what? And why? You can see that each one of us is doing selecting all the time. We forget we're choosing. And what we can do is we can fall asleep to the fact that we have any responsibility for our experience. And we can think it's come upon us. For example, I might be sitting here going, oh, look at that. Can you see that? And I, I'm focused on something, and I'm getting myself wild up about it. Look at this. People knew this was going on. What I'm forgetting in doing that is that I chose to look at that. And we have reasons for what we're choosing. And a lot of times the chooser is colored by our temperament. And that's part of how temperament works. The selecting experience. Each one of these four are like quadrants of consciousness. And you have to have some starting point. You have to have some. Because you might like to just step out of the game of temperament. Just as when we come to Earth, we create an individuality and we separate ourselves from another person. And we have an opportunity in doing that of meeting the other. If we couldn't separate, if we can't make a clear boundary, we also can't make a clear meeting. And you do find that this boundary making is one of the functions of the temperament. It's to help us 
step away from, know it. The healing of that process is the art. It could be the art. And it also could be uh, the process of love. Because through love, we heal that wound again, and what we see in the other, we can joyfully listen to the heart. And it could also be done through the mind in a process that McKenna Glossner at the Gertianum calls in look. And this is a very important one that I'd like you to um, think about this evening when I explain the temperaments to you. And the way it works is this. You might think of it as being one of the processes of drama. What does uh, an actor do when they have a role to take on? When they have a role, they say, okay, let me try to understand this character. Let me find out, not do I like this character. They don't say, do I like it? They say, let me try to understand how they work. Let me try to understand it so thoroughly that I could actually step into it. I would ask them, and I could get the gestures going without my having to stop and take them. Let me step right into it. Do you see how accepting you have to be? of that role, you have to be very accepting or you can't step into it. And yet, it may not be who you are yourself. If we didn't have all four temperaments in us, we wouldn't be able to do that. The other person would be like this complete mystery. Jean Campbell, part two. Piano calls in look. And this is a very important one that I'd like you to um, think about this evening when I explain the temperaments to you. And the way it works is this. You might think of it as being one of the processes of drama. What does uh, an actor do when they have a role to take on? When they have a role, they say, okay, let me try to understand this character. Let me find out, not do I like this character. They don't say, do I like it? They say, let me try to understand how they work. Let me try to understand it so thoroughly that I could actually step into it. I would ask them, and I could get the gestures going without my having to stop and take them. Let me step right into it. Do you see how accepting you have to be of that role? You have to be very accepting, or you can't step into it. And yet, it may not be who you are yourself. If we didn't have all four temperaments in us, we wouldn't be able to do that. The other person would be like this complete mystery. I have no idea what they're going to do next. Can't battle them at all. But if you can find it in yourself, and if you can slide through imagination and look through their eyes, you'll have profound it. We tried in Waldorf to teach children how to do that from a very early age. How do we do that? By having them become everything in the story. They We have them become <coughs> the wolf. They become the Lord Rise. They become. They become all of them. And their temperament, of course, will have an affinity for certain roles. But they become them all through imagination. And some of them, they just want to play over and over again with their sides and all of their glorious. As adults, we tend to get um, a little bit fixed in our self-definition, and the idea of stepping into a role and being a character, any kind of improvisation is like, well, it's a part of front. And yet, what if you are a mother or a father of a child with a completely different temperament? Are you going to hope that that child will come to you? Or are you going to go and meet the child where they're at? And look at the world through their eyes with your own adult perspective and come with it. And then be able to take the child's hand and lead them somewhere. Not to where you are necessarily, but to where they will be most fulfilled. As you're sitting there, you're holding a, a certain definition of who you are. Can you feel it? It's like you become so habitual. It was a very important thing to the government. Because 
really helps you get on to do something in life. You need to have that clear sense of self to go off and really do something in life. But there is an illusion because that's not who you are, really. It's not who you are. Because really what you are is potential. And you have the potential. If that's all that you were, you really have no freedom. Because the temperament is written from a very unconscious stage. And if that's all that you are, if you can't step out of it in any way, if you can't, in a way, get above it, then you're not really free. One of the things we used to do in the adult that really helped was that we needed to set ourselves uh, experiment. And I went into the yourself, you know, quite well conscious. But I was a teacher from a very early age and I had the control of a teacher and I was constantly capable and got through life. And when I went there I started to realize, well there's a whole half of life that I had to chop off just to have that. And I started to go, well, what about all those other ones? I actually see people going through life with all those other qualities. And they get by. Do I have to be this ultra responsible? You know, could I not have a little bit of irresponsibility, for example? So what I started to do was I started to look at all the things that I said no to. Everything that I said, well, no, that's not me, or that's not any good. And the things I said no to, I realized were barriers to my meeting a human being that carried that. Because if I say no to it, how am I going to meet the woman who comes, or the person who comes towards me with it? Because if I said no inside, I'm going to say no outside too. Right? So I said, okay, I've got a strong enough ego, I can go there. So I rolled up my sleeves figuratively, and I set myself a little tasks, and I started to study people, and I started to watch the things I rejected. And when I saw something I rejected, I thought, okay, I'm going to try it on. And I gave myself a little safe place to experiment. And I tried on that behavior somewhere. And I studied the way people, little gestures, everything, like I was an actress, you know, and then I would try it on. There are things you will learn by doing that that you'll never know any other way. It's incredible. I'll give you a small example. A friend of mine used to um, go to the restaurant with me, and she, I didn't even get to by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so rather, um, <laughs> and we used to go to the restaurant, and she used to embarrass me because she would always jump up and start running around the restaurant on the cigarette. And it was really very embarrassing to me because being very responsible, you don't go borrowing from strangers. It's rude. You don't do it. And uh, why should you be ripping them off? The other part of me was, well, you don't take these things from people because you can give them anything back. She just take and take and take it. And so I thought, well, and I was embarrassed. So I said, okay, there's a clear no. Mm. So I said, okay, one Saturday I got off room and I said, I'm going to go down to Yorkville and I'm going to start bumming cigarettes. <laughs> 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 All of us. So I did. <laughs> And I went off to people, and of course it didn't school, so that was the other thing. But I don't need to worry about that sort of thing. I was young. So, but I wanted to experience it. So I went up to a stranger and I said, Excuse me, do you have an empty cigarette? No, I could never have guessed the wisdom I got over that spirit. I couldn't have imagined. I couldn't know. No one would have told me about doing this. What happened was that this particular man turned around. Oh, oh, sure. And it was like somebody acknowledged him as a human being. He's so anonymous up there. He was proud. He was, and he didn't feel like I was taking it all. He felt like I was giving him something. It was amazing. I went, huh. Who would have thought? Like how literal I was in my thinking that she was taking and I was sitting there at the table all the time and never paying any attention to these strangers up there, you know eating my supper and talking to the one person I know, who was giving, who was taking. So I'm just inviting you, as we go through this, to try these on. Try them on. And if you're a teacher or a parent, and you start to recognize 
one of the children in your care, do it on their behalf. Try it on so that you really have this inner compassion and this inner empathy for their world. Let's build up a little picture here. <coughs> When we look out into the world, we see that there are some things that are of the mineral kingdom. And these are things that are matter and they don't have um, life like a plant does. And we say, okay, these things we will call physical. And I myself am made of some of this. I have physicality. There's part of me that is being used up and shed and will pass away. And that I call a physical level. And beside that, I can see that there are other things <coughs> that have something more than that, like the plant. I can say, you know, that plant has physicality, but unlike the mineral or the rock or the chair, it has something that is alive. So it has a life force. <coughs> Snyder calls the life force, which is also very form giving, he calls that the etheric. That's called the etheric principle. Just write these down here. <coughs> and he's saying that <coughs> the melancholic temperament is much more subject to the forces of physicality. While the phlegmatic temperament which I'll explain further, is much more subject to the etheric force. And neither of these are better than the other. One's not better. They're just different. <coughs> As well, I can look out and I can see <coughs> that there are other um, things in the world, animals, that have not only physicality, and not only have a life form, but they have something much more than the plant. They have a body that carries an instinct, desire, and even a certain type of thinking that animals can do. Those are completely other things that they carry. And that is called the astral. <coughs> and finally, I can see that there are human beings that have all of those and yet have something else, which is an individuality, something that is much beyond what the animal can do. And he refers to that as the ego. <laughs> it might look from the beginning that one is better than the other, but it really isn't. That's not what this is trying to say. It's just trying to say that this is one of the differences that each of these in the mixture, that part's stronger. What would it mean if your physicality was the strongest? Well, you can think about physicality, you can think about the laws of matter, and the first thing that you might think of is that they are subject to gravity. And so, you are subject more to gravity than you already are, what things would you begin to notice? Well, you might notice that your shoulders get a little heavier. You might notice that your face gets slightly longer. Perhaps your head sinks a little bit and it's a little bit heavier. Uh, it would take much more effort to, to lift and bounce, so it wouldn't be perhaps your normal load. You might feel um, a little bit more reserved. You might move a little slower. These are the effects of having more physicality. Whereas with the etheric body, you would have more levity. And it would be a lot easier to smile the cat or to walk with a little bit more of a lift. You wouldn't be subject to uh, the weightiness of things. This one we would call the levity force. <coughs> and this one would be the gravity. Now the same 
new one is working with a very different force, which is the one of uh, polarity. And the astral body has a force of um, pulling you in two different directions. <coughs> I like, I don't like. Good for me, not good for me. And so you can see that if that were working most strongly on you, almost every situation you're getting into, almost like instantaneously, you'd be either going this way or going that way. But it would happen so very fast. And in a sense, there'd be a changeable move to you. Uh, quite often children who are sanguine are follow that little verse. When they are good, they are very, very good. When they are bad, they are horrid. <laughs> and most children, because each age also has a temperament, children are in the sanguine age. So you see it more strongly. Uh, you could imagine if you were sanguine in a sanguine age. <laughs> it would be... It would be very exciting, <laughs> but it would also be uh, very rapid um, if something didn't work for you. You would also very quickly get annoyed and frustrated because your likes and dislikes would be very fast, and they're strong. They're very strong. So you would be much more visible in the classroom. In fact, Snyder <laughs> also Snyder <laughs> also says that. Um, Probably the first thing you should do as a teacher is when the children come in and you know your temperament, spot your little family. And as they come in, if you could just give them even just the slightest little special thought or the slightest little <laughs> indication that you're there for them, it'll change everything. Because they are working so much out of this um, uh, personality that it would mean the world to them if you could just give them some little special thing. And it can be very subtle. You can even just go over the smallest little touch. The key is the same as the child, and you said, is the relationship between the adult and the child. So if everything hinges on the relationship, you have to give them a little bit just to start them off the day. Now we take a look at, uh, so this one is polarity. <clears throat> and with the choleric, the choleric is ego force. You have, uh, I mean, the choleric uh, is a thought that is thought to fix that too. However, the ego is the part of the human being that has the potential for bringing some kind of dynamic balance. And even though most cholerics aren't in dynamic balance, it has that possibility. <coughs> that doesn't mean a fixed balance. It means that it's always um, a shifting balance. We're working between inner and outer. We're working between mixing the ingredients of things. So it's a very dynamic balance. <coughs> The other ones you have to really pay attention to in the classroom, right at the very beginning, are the cholerics. And you don't need to worry, they'll find you. <laughs> you don't have to worry about finding them. <laughs> These are the children um, of fire. These are the fire beings. And you can hear them coming sometimes long before they get there. I remember when I had a kindergarten, I had a very wild well little choleric boy, and I could hear him getting off the bus, and I could hear him all the <laughs> way and I, and I mean, it was just like feeling the, uh, the seismic wave heading your way, you know? <laughs> I, just, I used to jokingly turn to the other teacher and the other child and say, I see my rubber nose, I'm going to need it. <laughs> Humor is, is a very important thing to work with the choleric because they are fairly serious and fire can really burn. With the choleric, you have to understand that um, this fire is the root of passion, it's the root of um, commitment, it's the root of leadership. It's a very powerful force. And they came in with that 
tool. They carry that sword and they're off to do something. You have no idea what they're going to do in life. But your job is not to talk to me. But your job is also not to let the one side of yourself it trash everyone around us or themselves. So it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of skill to really work well with the choleric. These two temperaments, the sanguine and the choleric, this is our child of air, these two um, are your extroverts. And in the classroom, those are the ones that will quite often set the pace. Because they're the ones that are responding and bringing that um, moving energy. Um, one of the indications is that you take the sanguine, you will take all the temperaments and fit them together. Some people, in your way of teaching, you and I just started, you try and mix them up. So you get your choleric in it, you put one here, put one there, put one there, <laughs> try to separate them all out and think that maybe you're going to have a better year that way. Because if they ever got them together, they would steamroll you. But it actually works in reverse here. So the principle is that life feels like that if you put, for example, a choleric sitting right next to the phlegmatic, actually the phlegmatic would be carrying much more than their fair share of the burden of being next to the choleric. <laughs> there would be a bullying going on, and the phlegmatic might not even say anything, but it's, just, it's not a good situation. But if the choleric is sitting next to another choleric, they can try something, but they get it right back. For the choleric, it's like children in the sandbox who feel equal. You take my truck and I hit you. You know, it's like it's very... <laughs> they feel equal. See? Unfortunately, sometimes they feel equal in areas where they're not equal. They feel, they, they feel equal to the adults in areas that they're not. There's many areas they are, they're choleric, they're equal. But they're not equal in knowledge, they're not equal in responsibility, they're not equal in uh, power. There's all kinds of areas that are not equal. But they will try very hard because they carry this ego force and they feel it in them already. And they will want to be in control. They want to be in charge. And if you have a choleric child, you might think, well, I can uh, negotiate. <laughs> First of all, you probably don't have the skill. <laughs> you know, they'll outdo you. you know, also, you might try to compromise. I'll tell you something, a choleric, if you find it in yourself, your own choleric, think about yourself when you feel, you know, like you own the world, you know. Like, what are you looking at? You know, if you just really explain it in yourself, you know. But, <laughs> it's going to be on my turn. Compromise is a joke. Why would you compromise if you are the king? <laughs> you know? So what happens is you, as a very loving, very teacher, try to... They hate it. They don't respect it. And what happens is they keep sand in your face. They keep wondering why you're... They don't fit in sand. They don't respect you. What would they respect? They would respect someone who already had it together, who was ahead of them. They would respect some confidence. Now, imagine if you're a mother or a father, and you feel a little bit like this kind of cozy or cozy. You say things like, oh, silly mommy, look what I do. Silly, silly mommy. Then you have a color chop. They're going to be taken to the cleaner. <laughs> because they're working very subconsciously, but they will hate it. And they will keep pushing to try and get you to get somewhere, to meet them. They are, they're playing hardball. And you're doing silly me. It's not positive. <laughs> now you can do it with another temperament, it's not so bad. But maybe, maybe you try it with your first child. 
how do you say this? Because I don't know anything. Maybe you tried it with your first child and it worked perfectly. So you thought, well, I'll try it again with my second. And you go, I don't know what happened. They're just so different. <laughs> they are. There was a, a definition of selflessness where uh, that we have to get rid of. And the definition was that you are selfless by letting the other person call the shop. And you keep them happy. Or you go along with them. And somehow that kind of self-sacrificing noble thing got into our collective subconscious. Well, it's a very wrong way, I think, to proceed. A better way to interpret selflessness is to say, this little persona that I'm hanging on to like a pit bull, can I not try to meet what is being called for in this situation? And maybe it's not my usual temperament to feel like the cock of the walk, but perhaps that's what's really needed here with great love. And maybe, can I not use the mind Little bit. And even if I'm tired, it's not really what I feel like doing. But I know that's what's needed here. When you stand up in front of a class, sometimes you just don't feel. You don't have the energy. But you, as a teacher, aren't going to sit there and say, "Okay, kids, just just go ahead. I'm just going to sit here for a minute." And <laughs> 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 you don't. What you do is you say a prayer and then you just rally your forces. So in a sense, the path of parenthood and the path of a teacher is a path of initiating yourself. And part of that initiating yourself is going beyond what was written in the unconscious and being able to go into these realms. Now these are your extroverts, and these of course are your introverts. This is the first category that I usually use to study my class. I say, okay, which ones are much more comfortable processing the things in the inner world? And then which are the ones that they do the processing out here? You can do that if you want to discover your own time start with that. It doesn't mean there won't be times when you will be um, extroverted, even if you're introverted. For example, maybe you're most extroverted at a party. Most people are. It's, but what is your normal mode? And which one do I tend to be for? Then you know, okay, well, this is going too left. The melancholic is the most inward, and the choleric is the most outward. So these are, the further you go this way, more extroverted, more introverted. <coughs> um, if you want to understand what it's like to work with a family child, think about maybe the party that you went to that you were very sick. Who says you have to be at a party? You can actually just use that as an example and then claim it as a capacity in yourself. Say you have it when you want it. And when you tell the story, and if it's a family girl or a very family boy, your fingers will automatically point up. Your eyebrows will lift automatically. You don't have to think about it. You just listen to the energy of the children. You don't have to. And the thing to do is to take on each of these temperaments and internalize them as a tool. They're just ways of being. <coughs> Why do you always have to just use the one? And fly to the other? All the world on the stage. Is there anyone here who knows their temperament? <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Is there anyone who knows that they're extroverted or introverted? You got that part? Okay, let's keep going then. 
For those of you that um, <laughs> for those of you that think you're extroverted, <laughs> the same wind will likely have um, they'll have gestures, lots of gestures that are very cool. They are handsome movies and they are very expressive. They are very verbal. And you can they can almost be mesmerized by them. They have a lot of charm when they're up, you know, a lot of charm. And even when they're not, they can be quite charming even when they're a little uh, petulant. But you can get mesmerized by them. In fact, I've seen grown men <laughs> get mesmerized by the sense of yeah. <laughs> they just can't take their eyes off them. They are so vibrant. <laughs> However, what they don't understand about the penguin is that the penguin is very, um, uh, everything is judged by how they feel at the moment. They're very present oriented. So maybe today, you are the most excited thing in the world. But you might not be tomorrow. <laughs> so for the moment it was a great party. And then things changed. Now every one of the temperaments has their uh, self centered some focus and sustainability and, oh yeah, 
basis, they're going into some depth with it, then what you have to do is you have to find a nice subtle way to make it disappear. Let's see if you really think that, they feel that just really love it, so give them four more. You know, it's like, this is the wisdom of it, you have to make it disappear. Why? So they, yeah, so that something in them can be created which has a focus and out of a yes. And then what happens is when they start to focus that um, concentrated yes out into the world, then it can come back and be and it's just a whole other level of falling into it. So you're actually, it's like stretching. You might say to the young child learning to walk, you say, come to mind, you know, little baby start walking, what do you do? Back a step, right? Back a step. See? Because you're trying to develop the capacity. The memories of sanguine are not very good. They're not strong. So, which has a good side? Because when they have this big psychological back on the playground, which is guaranteed, so and so then it's like so and so, so and so won't be playing with so and so. They have a little back. And the teacher could get all involved in it. It might even be out of their memory by the next day. They don't really, the memories of that song is not the next thing. In learning, that's part of the problem. <laughs> that the memory. Um, as, as children, we all have a lot of things. So, I remember so often in school, the teacher would be up there talking, and I'd be sitting in my desk. And I was just sitting there kind of going, uh, you know, you kind of, you, you're sort of pretending almost that you're listening, but you're not really listening, you're just kind of <laughs> checking out the space, you're looking out the window, seeing what someone's still doing, so your mind is just kind of traveling around, taking things in. So this is one of the problems. The, the same one, charm, 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 but not any easier than any of the others. And being extroverted, there's a demand on the energy. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but being around children with high energy, at night when you just feel like something's going to hold off you, you're tired in a different way. There's an energetic period. With the choleric, you're not going to get the charm, but you're going to get the energy. <laughs> but they might teach you quite a few things about strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really interesting to see how this leadership, the passages that they come in, in what area it might end up going. You just kind of want to. There is a natural leadership. And there, as long as they can focus their power on behalf of the whole of the good, of the whole, then they can be a tremendous contribution. But if it's for their own end, it can become uh, a plastic bullet or an intimidator. Now, more than you say, both of you there. Again, I'm not trying to um, close the door on you looking <laughs> into it. There are times when it's essential to both, or to at least have the capacity. What about the person who sees a complete injustice and just doesn't have the inner fortitude and courage to face up to something? Because in their mind, they reject it. That can happen. They said, oh, well, that's not my that push you forward. Well, you walk well past this man's time. Well, not past, but I forgot to tell you, saying words exaggerate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything comes dramatically. But you've locked off the behavior of everyone who comes towards you that has the assertiveness. You find ways to put it down. But you're robbing yourself. It's like the, the sword that has no hand, or you got a blade on both hands. When you go to say no to them, you just separate yourself from it. And there are 
which is just so always predictably there, and there for me and there positively. And she would get into whatever I talked about. <coughs> Amazing. <coughs> the melancholic, their element would be earth. Okay, so I'll give it a little bit of time then I would really open up things to earth. And of course their orientation is to the past. The melancholic has a very good memory. Usually it's about things that are directly connected to what happened to them. Quite often it has to be something that wasn't very pleasant. Right. Somebody <laughs> might have gone. Same way could be scanning, finding what do I like, what do I like, what do I like. I like. They might be going up going, okay, what is it that causes a certain pain? Of all the experiences that are out there, you might say, well, I'm getting a quick that. It's the funny thing about this is how if you don't have enough melancholic in you, you might think that this is not a good thing to do. But on the other hand, look at it this way. You're all going to die. You might be thinking it's a and you're not. You're going to die. Okay? Why do we get the gift of the Why do we have that gift in the community? Because imagine what some of us would be like. Well, we would just be so superficial. We would be, we would just float off to the end of our life and say, no, what the heck is that? We would have something that brought us back to the most important question of the meaning of life. And how many of you really would care to look there unless you had something to urge you? Normally what you would do is try to avoid it and try to party to this impulse that they gave us that. But we would often say, I look at the suffering and the pain that I have had in life, and I actually can come to a place where 